Thank you all for coming. It's with a, uh, a great deal of peace this morning, uh, and I'm glad my minister's here to hear that word, that I'm excited and enthusiastic to announce my candidacy to be the next Lieutenant Governor of North Carolina. Uh, in many respects, uh, I may be uh, uh, m the most unlikely person to ever stand here to make this announcement. <clears throat> As I was uh, down here last night setting up the chairs, I remembered pedaling my bicycle down Academy Street to an Allstate office, which was right here behind me, trying to help my mother pay her car insurance when I was 11 years old. And I was $3 short. And Ray Hall, who was her agent, took $3 out of her po his pocket <clears throat> and helped make that premium. And I can tell you from that point to this point that everything I've accomplished, I've never accomplished anything alone. It's been people like him in my life who has helped me uh, do the things that I've done. Starting with my family, and as our goddaughter likes for me to recharacterize our family, which is our family and our friends, uh, I'm very pleased uh, to make this announcement. We're going to be launching this campaign by talking about fixing problems. If I have to hear one more speech about what the problems are without a solution, I think I'm going to throw up. People want their problems fixed. They don't care how it's done. They just want their problems fixed. Uh, we have a professional grade organization that's going to be running this campaign. Uh, many of who are here today, uh, Brian and Josh and uh, Cindy, the compliance, my wife, of course. Uh, you were all supposed to be sitting in one place so I could tell, <laughs> tell who you were. Uh, but uh, Nathan uh, and, and Kevin, who's uh, back home doing all this electronically, uh, Jason, Chris, David, a professional great organization uh, from nuts to bolts, from the social media to the finance to the grassroots, because we have a message to tell people across this state that we're at a tipping point. And we're at a tipping point where we're either going to repair what we have in North Carolina or we're going to lose it. And I want to be part of repairing it. The, the other improbable part about this press conference is that the people sitting behind me are a great part of the success of me standing here. <laughs> because these people from all different kinds of backgrounds are individuals who told me some problems that needed to be fixed. Not necessarily problems that all of you thought of this morning when you woke up, but problems that needed to be corrected to make North Carolina a better place to live. Those problems really break out into four broad categories. Education, crime prevention and public safety, government efficiency, and family values. So with that, I'd like to uh, give each one of them a couple of minutes to uh, introduce themselves and to talk a little bit about uh, how I listened, how I acted, and how, how I fixed the problems that they brought to my attention, uh, starting with Dr. Don Martin, superintendent. Well, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, actually, Dale was on the school board that hired me back in 1994 here in Winston-Salem, Forsyth County. And in fact, we sat next to each other for several years, and I got to know Dale's family uh, very well during that time. I can tell you that uh, the two, I'm just going to give you two very quick examples of fixing things that are very kind of small devils in the details. I think everyone in this room is familiar with more at four um, pre-K, kindergarten, pre-K classes. Um, as schools began to, as those funds were available to provide opportunities for, for preschool kids, four-year-olds, it just so happened that four-year-olds, their buildings were governed, their building code and building standards were governed by the Department of Social Services, not, not the Department of Public Instruction. So every time we tried to have a convert a kindergarten class to a pre-kindergarten class, pre-K class, we ended up with a, having to do all sorts of fix-ups. We'd have to spend money to have a four-year-old where we've had five-year-olds in the same classroom. And I explained that frustration uh, today. I'm talking about how much money we were spending to do that. He said, well, that sounds like something we ought to be able to get an exception for. If we have a, a building that's safe enough for a five-year-old, it's probably safe enough for a four-year-old um, in terms of building codes. 
And so he did that. He worked on that project. It's fairly short. I got a lot of support. Signed into law in 2009. Um, in, in a similar way, um, as we've had issues, you know, we work very closely with law enforcement. We have school resource officers in all of our middle and high schools. And needless to say, sharing information is very important. And one of those areas has to do with sort of gang types, types of involvement. And if there are things that are being rumored and discussed and, you know, and, and the, the, the law enforcement knows about, these very children may be in our classroom. So should we have some knowledge? We could not share that information. I, I, I shared that frustration with Dale and they said, well, we ought to be able to figure out a way that law enforcement and school personnel can discuss these kind of issues so that we're all on the same page. And he did. He worked that out. It was signed into law also. So those are two very short examples of sort of fixing fairly on the ground problems. And uh, I've always found Dale very responsive to that and I've always appreciated that uh, very much. Thank you. Uh, I'm Jim Lastly with the uh, Viana Fire Department. And uh, back in 2009, OSHA was closing the junior member cadet program. Basically, they were saying that we couldn't train anybody under the age of 18. And uh, my dad, uh, Chief Tim Lassley out of Vianna, uh, he called Dale uh, and explained to him the problem that without any junior firefighters, you're not gonna have any volunteer firefighters. Without any volunteer firefighters, there's a higher cost to the department. And with the higher cost of the department, you have higher property taxes, higher insurance <coughs> rates. And when my dad talked to Mr. Falwell, he uh, just took care of it. They took it to the uh, house and uh, got it passed into law. And we, didn't, we can now train anybody we want to. Um, my name is Jeannie Metcalf, and um, I've, I served on the school board with Dale. Um, he was on the board when I was elected in 94, and I served uh, up until he, uh, he, he left the board. And the thing about having two education people speak to you this morning is that the one that goes first sometimes gets all the, takes all my points. <laughs> so, <laughs> two things I want to talk to you about this morning, though, that, that Dale did. Um, uh, in 2009, we spoke to Dale about the fact that school employees, we, we had school employees who were about to be dismissed for the worst offenses of dealing with sexual perversion, embezzlement, et cetera, and they could resign right before being dismissed and apply and work in another school district with a clean record. As one of the largest districts, we were kicking the can down the road and many cans got kicked to us. He introduced and passed the Safe Students Act in 2009 that requires this to be reported to other districts to prevent this from happening. He listened, he acted, he fixed the problem to protect children. The other thing Dale did, um, in North Carolina, it used to be you had, you, by October 16th, if you were five, you could start kindergarten. And many of us in education, although I'm not in education, I just, I'm, I'm involved in it. I felt like um, that was way too young for kids to be starting school and Dale felt that same way and one of the first things he did after he was elected was to get the age moved back to August 31st which gives kids a head start. We had one of the latest start dates in the country and after he sponsored this, this bipartisan legislation and got it passed there was a seven page article written about this in the New York Times Magazine. So when we go to Dale with something that needs to be done, Dale fixes it. And on a personal note, I have been in politics for a long time. I know a lot of politicians. Dale is my favorite by far. He doesn't do this for power. He doesn't do it for money. He does it truly, truly to make things better. He will do anything. He will work hard. He works hard. He will open any door. He comes to meetings to speak to people with props. He brings license tags. He brings, he, he's just, he's a brilliant man. And he wants to serve the people, but more than anything that I can say about him that I hope gets, that the voters can see is he cares. He truly, truly cares and wants to make North Carolina the best place for us to raise our children. Thank you. My name is Mark Stevens. I'm from Mount Airy. I am not a politician. I've never been a big fan of politicians. <laughs> Mr. Mr. Falwell come to my office one day and we're in the Memorial Division. I'm the second generation. And he come to have a service that I uh, offer. And after we completed everything, Mr. Falwell come back and 
he sat down and, you know, a lot of times they're there, they're 15 minutes or uh, you don't seem to, they, that they care. But he took a genuine interest in us. He asked me what was some problem that we were facing in small business. And uh, we are a small business. We have 18 employees. And I said, Mr. Falwell, the, the, the biggest thing to us right now is facing the law of North Carolina Workman's Comp. They're just beating us to death. They're beating us to death. The, the employer has no say-so. Uh, it doesn't matter what the employees say or claim. It goes through. Uh, so Mr. Falwell, he did. He, he told me, he said, I'll look into this. Well, him being a politician, you thought, well, I'm a little fella and he's gone, you know. But I got a phone call later. He said he's working on the bill to go through. He checked some other places the state of North Carolina. I believe it was a Goodyear plant. He went and talked to those, see what kind of problems they were having. Same thing. They had to produce 3,000 tires a day, 3,000, just to pay the workman's comp back before they done anything. And it's absolutely ridiculous. It got plumb out of hand. Uh, I think Mr. Falwell and, and I agree upon that if you have an employee injured, they ought to be entitled. But when it's time for them to go back to work, they need to go to work. They don't need to, to, to ride that train. So uh, Mr. Falwell is, is one of a few that I've ever met that made a return. If he made that return call, that he had worked on a bill, and it did get passed. So I think it'll affect all of us. If we don't change the state of North Carolina, we're all going to be in trouble. And that goes not just for North Carolina, but the whole country. But uh, he, he's a man that's generally concerned. And just, I'd like to thank you. My name is Chris Parker, and I'm the administrator of Vienna Village, which is a family-owned and operated assisted living facility uh, out in Louisville. Uh, we're licensed for 90 residents, and we have over 70 caregivers at Vienna Village. Now, we are a third-generation uh, family-owned and operated company, and we were founded back in 1965 uh, by my wife's uh, grandmother and her, her two sisters. Now, I come today to you to recommend a man who thinks creatively outside of the box. When he is presented with an issue from his constituents, he listens to their needs, analyzes the problem, and does its best to come up with a solution. Case in point, the original part of Vienna Village was built in 1965 with several additions added over the next 20 years. In 2007, we decided to add a bed neutral addition to better serve our customers' changing needs. Our original plans were impro for improvements over $2 million. This would not only have improved our residents' lives, but it would have added much needed construction jobs to the area. However, when we discovered that there was a $2 million certificate of need cap, we decided to scale back our improvements. The additional requirements CON would have forced upon us would not have allowed us to continue to have the direct relationship that we currently have with our customers. The CON requirements we face were the same that a hospital does, and they are quite onerous. We had already spent almost two years just meeting all the other regulatory requirements, and this would have further lengthened the process for us. We came to Representative Falwell with our dilemma. He worked during 2008 and 9 to come up with a bill that would address our concerns. He worked with government agencies, private associations, hospitals, and many others. And in the end, he delivered a bill that was passed with an overwhelming majority. Since this bill passed in 2009, many facilities such as ours have been able to improve our accommodations to better serve the needs of the elderly in North Carolina. Now, when many politicians want to grow the size of government, Representative Falwell understands that government should be serving the people. The people should not be servants of the government bureaucracy. When so many politicians only want to talk and debate, Dale listens. I mean, he really listens. Then he studies the issues, gathers the parties together, comes up with creative solutions that are fiscally responsible for both state and business. The citizens and small businesses of North Carolina need someone in government who listens, who understands, and who is creative in dealing with their issues. We need Dale Falwell as our next Lieutenant Governor.
Well, good morning. Good morning. I'm Sheriff Bill Schatzman here and uh, work with the Forsyth County Sheriff's Office and the 575 men and women who uh, try and protect each of us uh, here in Forsyth County every day. I am extremely proud and privileged to be here this morning to talk about my friend Dale Falwell. Uh, I've known Dale, oh uh, gosh, since way before I became sheriff uh, and his family, and um, I know them to be honest folks who deserve our trust. Dale has pro proved that to me over the years by listening to what I had to say and others in law enforcement had to say, his conversations with the North Carolina Sheriff's Association, to address the needs of law enforcement and the needs of public, and the needs of public safety uh, here in North Carolina, and certainly my concerns here in Forsyth County. Uh, Dale has been instrumental uh, in influencing many legislation, much legislation coming out of Raleigh, and particularly more than a half dozen laws that affect public safety and um, uh, law enforcement, enhances law enforcement. And for that, we are eternally grateful to Dale uh, and, his, and his associates down in Raleigh, and, and Dale in a leadership role as, as a, a pro tem, leader pro tem, speaker pro tem. One comes to mind is a run, and you're, a run and you're done. That, of course, is the forfeiture of a, of a, a motor vehicle uh, um, that is, uh, tries to evade law enforcement, uh, having been involved in a, a felony or a crime or, or suspected of being involved in a crime, a felony. Uh, one of the most dangerous things law enforcement can do um, for the law enforcement officer involved, and you've read about it, it's been covered in the press, uh, and uh, one of the most dangerous things that the public can experience is a pursuit by law enforcement of a vehicle uh, running at high rates of speed to avoid uh, arrest. Uh, with running you're done, the, the forfeiture of the motor vehicle and other assets uh, on, uh, 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 in the possession of those individuals responsible for uh, speeding to evade uh, enhances law enforcement's ability to enforce the law. It puts some real teeth um, in, um, in our uh, way to uh, serve the public. And for that, we are eternally grateful uh, to Dale. Uh, others uh, involved in uh, work, his work on identity theft, his work on uh, officers uh, who are active duty and sworn, can carry concealed, off duty. Uh, there are many, more than a half dozen, and I won't go into them all. I just want to say I am proud that uh, someone from Forsyth County is taking on the initiative of, of, of again, another statewide office of more responsibility. Uh, I'm proud to call Dale my friend. Uh, I know that I can trust him, and I know uh, that he'll do, he can fix uh, the problems. He'll work hard. He's one of the hardest working representatives uh, in Raleigh we have, and, and uh, I wish him Godspeed, God bless, and thank you for your service. Good morning. My name is Ken Burkle, and I have served as chairman of the North Carolina License to Give Trust Fund Commission, which is a state commission uh, that, whose purpose is to uh, raise awareness and encourage all citizens to be organ and tissue donors. And Dale has always been a proponent of organ and tissue donation, but until recently, our law was that a little hard on your license if someone had, had the intent to be an organ donor, that was exactly it, it was intent. And at the time when their organ may be most needed, there was a lot of red tape confusion. And bottom line, we weren't getting the number of donations that we really needed and should have from those very people. And Dale saw this as a problem and introduced a legislation called the Heart Prevails. And the Heart Prevails simply it means just that. And that is that for those people who want to be organ donors, uh, it's now not intent but law because of that. And uh, the North Carolina Eye Bank, for example, here in Winston-Salem, has reported a 52% increase in donations since that became law. Uh, as a byproduct of that, he also introduced as a, uh, an amendment to that uh, that uh, reduced the uh, age for, for giving blood from 17 to 16, which has resulted in an additional 20,000 pints of blood annually. So these are, are, are really human things that touch all of us. And I would have to say that from my experience with Dale, uh, he's not, uh, he cares. And what I'm hearing from everyone else this morning and from my experience, 
Uh, I think we all, have, as, as citizens, are frustrated with government because it seems to have lost its common sense. And I think Dale Falwell represents good, common sense thinking that makes decisions in the best interest of all of us at a cost we can afford. And I wish Dale the best of luck. Good morning. My name's Kevin Guskowitz, and I'm a professor at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill and the co-director of the Matthew Gefeller Sport-Related Traumatic Brain Injury Research Center. And uh, I want to both congratulate Dale today and, uh, and thank Dale today. Uh, unlike most of you in the room, uh, I've known Dale for about one year. Uh, but I can tell you in that one year, I learned an awful lot about a man, his passion, and uh, taking on a problem. And not only uh, the end result, uh, but also how you get to that point. Uh, House Bill 792, uh, the Gefeller Waller Concussion Act, uh, which was signed by Governor uh, Beverly Perdue on uh, June 16th of this past year, uh, was uh, a very important uh, uh, bill that became law. It was a very important day, a day I'll never forget as I uh, stood there right alongside Dale and uh, did something very special uh, for uh, youth athletes here in the state of North Carolina. Now, we may think that uh, a bill that, uh, that addresses something that maybe as trivial as sport uh, is really not that important, but I would argue uh, that uh, we are a sport-crazed society, and that's a good thing. Uh, sport builds character, builds discipline. Uh, it teaches uh, young uh, children to work, uh, how to work together, and, uh, and Dell recognized that. In 2008, we had three uh, deaths uh, at the high school level in, uh, from August through um, mid-September. And one of those individuals was Matthew Gefeller, who I know many of you know, uh, know the Gefeller family here in Winston-Salem. And uh, Dale wanted to do something. He sat and he listened. He listened to the needs of uh, those at the uh, public school setting in, in terms of putting in place uh, guidelines for how to manage not only sport-related concussion and traumatic brain injury, but also putting emergency action plans in place. Uh, as a result of Dale's efforts in uh, championing this, uh, this bill through, uh, we now, I'm, I'm proud to say that in the state of North Carolina, uh, we have the best uh, concussion law in the country. There are now 32 states that have a concussion law, and uh, hands down, ours is the best. The remaining states that now have pending legislation are modeling the one uh, that together uh, I had an opportunity to work with Dale in, uh, in putting together, and uh, he should be proud to know that he has one that other states are modeling after. So, uh, I again, I've only known Dale for one year, uh, but I, I learned an awful lot about him. Those that knew, knew him well said, be patient, uh, he will get it done, uh, and, and he certainly did. So I thank you for that and congratulate you uh, on your candidacy. So. Thank you all. Uh, I want to say on behalf of the citizens of North Carolina that, and you've heard me say this before, that, uh, that I was the mule and you were the brains. Uh, but for you bringing this idea, these ideas to my attention, uh, these fixes would have never have occurred. I read something the other day that many of you are familiar with, that uh, these folks had a squeak in their hardwood floor, and they called all these people out to find out where the squeak was. and. And uh, finally, this old gentleman comes in, and he walks around a little bit, takes a nail out of his mouth, and he drives it in, squeaks gone. And he hands him a bill for $100, $2 for the nail, and $98 to know where to drive it. <laughs> and with these ideas that you've heard behind me, uh, I tried over the last seven years to find out where to drive the nail to fix the problems of North Carolinians. It's been a lost decade in North Carolina. It's been a lost decade in terms of jobs. It's been a lost decade in terms of stress on family. As we stand here this morning, the largest employer in 18 counties in North Carolina is the unemployment check. The largest employer in Mecklenburg County today is the unemployment check. It's been the lost decade of family values. It's been the lost decade of illegal immigration. Our growth rate, estimated growth rate for illegal immigration over the last 10 years uh, exceeded New Mexico, Texas, Arizona, and California in terms of growth rate. We have a lot of things that need fixing. And as I may have said earlier, I completely disagree with the national press who say they want us all to get along. I don't think there's anybody in this room who really cares if I get along with anybody. You really don't care about my bedside manner. You want your problems fixed. 
and we must fix the problems in North Carolina uh, if we're going to move forward. I also want to say, especially to Jim, uh, I asked Jim to come here today uh, in replacement in, instead of his father, who's the chief of the Vianna Fire Department. And uh, Jim says, well, at 10 o'clock, I can't be there because I have to be at school. And I said, where do you go to school, Jim? He said, well, I'm taking classes at Forsyth Tech. And I said, well, what class do you have at 10 o'clock? He said, public speaking. <laughs> <laughs> so if somebody will, in the media will inform his, his teacher that he uh, fulfilled his requirement of public speaking, let's give Jim a hand. <laughs> I will, uh, I will say that uh, the 29 major pieces of legislation that I have had the opportunity to author to fix the problems of North Carolinians, that's all in the past. That's in the elapsed time. What needs to happen going forward is to make sure that the next decade is not the lost decade in North Carolina. And we're only going to do that by listening, acting, and fixing. Uh, the bottom line is that we have a, a lot of work to do. And for most of our lifetimes, we have gone down the road of separating people in this state, dividing them by gender, by color, by economic status. Well, I'll tell you this as strongly as I possibly can. We're looking down the barrel of arithmetic right now. In so many ways, we have some of the largest mathematical problems of any state there is. You know that Governor Christie was here recently uh, to talk about things that are going on in New Jersey. Well, I'm sad to inform you of this, that I would trade my high school dropout rate for his. I would trade my four-year college graduation rate for his. I would trade my unemployment rate for his. I would trade my unfunded health care liability as a percentage of our operating budget for his. We have a lot of work to do, and it starts with brains. The number one natural resource of this state is brains, and we're wasting a whole lot of them. These are the things that I intend to work on. Over the next 20 weeks, every week, you're going to hear a different solution out of me along the areas that I've worked on in the past. Education, government efficiency, the regulation and family values, uh, and crime and public safety. Every week for the next 20 weeks, and every day, every business day for the next 20 weeks, you're going to hear something out of me about two or three sentences called, have we lost our marbles? The incredibly stupid stuff that the state or the federal government makes the citizens of North Carolina do that needs to be fixed. As I started this conversation, I talked about that I'm at peace. That's something Congresswoman <laughs> Fox told me just a few days ago about how she felt when she decided to get out of the boat. Get out of the boat. My minister is here, Jock Hollis talked about this almost a year ago. Matthew 14, stop looking and stop asking for more blessings. Take account of the blessings that God's already given you. And the reason I'm standing here today is I'm getting out of the boat. As Speaker Pro Tem of the House, I was dry and I was warm. But I think we're at a tilting point in North Carolina where we had either have to repair what we have and we're gonna, or we're gonna lose it. And if God has given people the blessings to take those intellectual risk, to take those policy risk, to go out and make the North Carolina better for North Carolinians, then that's my calling. And that's why I'm standing here today.